Welcome to Mental Health and You. This podcast brings you the best information and advice from across the Norfolk and Suffolk Foundation Trust. Every fortnight, we will hear from one of our specialist areas, be it school and parent support, the recovery college, well-being or research. Today's podcast is about sleep and the effect that it can have on your mental health and is presented to you by Rachel, that's me, hello, and Tim. Hi, that's me. Who are peer support workers within the Wellbeing Service. Joining us today will be Eleanor. Hi everyone. Who is a psychological wellbeing practitioner within the Wellbeing Service. So today's podcast will cover what are peer support workers, what are psychological wellbeing practitioners, sleep and our mental health, sharing peer support workers lived experiences of managing sleep difficulties alongside managing their mental health. We hope that you come away from today's podcast with an understanding of how sleep can affect your mental health and get some ideas of strategies to manage sleep difficulties. So just to introduce peer support work to you if you've not heard of peer support workers before. So peer support workers like myself and Tim are employed by the wellbeing service and we all have our own experience of living with mental health challenges. And the idea of our job is that we share that experience with others along with our recovery stories to offer hope. We use our experience of recovery to help people make sense of what they are going through and to explore what may support them in their recovery. Now, the, the role of a psychological wellbeing practitioner is slightly different. Do you mind sort of sharing with us what your role is? Yeah, of course. So the role of a psychological wellbeing practitioner is to support and empower people to develop and use coping strategies in order to manage common mental health difficulties. So things like stress, low mood, depression and anxiety. Thank you. Now, so like I said, today's podcast is all about sleep. So I thought we'd start off with a little uh, straw poll of how was everybody sleep? So if I start, um, I, I went to bed rather early and I was woken up at about 3 a.m. this morning by some squawking seagulls uh, above my house that I found quite difficult to, to zone out and took me a while to, to be able to get back to sleep. So this morning I'm kind of feeling, you know, that sluggish kind of, I've not slept brilliantly kind of feeling my brain's not quite working on all cylinders. So that's me this morning. Uh, Tim, how was yours? Yeah, so I've had a few late nights in a row um, for no other reason than there's a particular game that I'm enjoying at the moment. Um, maybe not a long term thing I can maintain, um, but just being aware of it is helpful. OK, yeah. So like, like you say, when we get into something and there's that the feeling of, oh, OK, but I'm really enjoying this. Oh, but I should be off going to sleep. And yeah, kind of kind of thinking about how that how that works and um, it's, it's something that comes along I think anybody you know at the moment when we're uh, recording this uh, podcast today the Olympics is on and it's on in Tokyo so completely different time zone so if you're wanting to watch it it's that decision of oh do I stay up all night and and watch or do I get up early and watch and and like you say on a short-term basis you know how that affects us and on long term as well thank you Tim and Eleanor what about you how was your sleep I mean, I was I was quite lucky. I slept quite well last night. Um, mm. I did go to sleep at a reasonable time, um, but I'm a very heavy sleeper, so I can sleep through anything. So that's ah, good. Interesting. And yeah, it's interesting, like Tim and I are like two ends of a scale on sleep, aren't we? So I've gone really quite early and Tim's gone really quite late. And it kind of looks like, Eleanor, you're nicely in the middle in terms of sort of managing that. But I think you know, just us three, it kind of shows, doesn't it, how differently sleep can kind of work and the different things that kind of can impact and affect it. And, you know, that's just the three of us. If it was asking more people, we'd get, you know, lots more information there. So thank you. So, Eleanor, I thought it'd be really helpful for, for the people listening today to, to understand why we need to sleep. So, you know, why do we do it? How does it help us? Do you mind kind of sort of sharing that with us? Yeah, definitely. So there's many benefits to getting a good night's sleep. So just to, I guess, highlight a few of those benefits. 
Um, sleep strengthens our immune systems. So sleep helps our bodies to conserve energy, um, which is going to be really helpful for the immune system to use if we're feeling under the weather or if we're perhaps trying to fight off any germs or illnesses. Um, and I guess linking nicely to that, sleep helps to repair our tired bodies as well. Um, you know, it gives us the opportunity to rest, recharge our batteries. Um, and I, I know we were talking about this a bit earlier, you know, if you do go to sleep with perhaps a graze or a cut on your body, likelihood is that when you wake up the next morning, it started to scab over or, or heal. So sleep really is a healing process as well. Um, just a few more benefits. So I've talked about the physical benefits of getting a good night's sleep there, but sleep also helps our, um, I guess, our brains. You know, it helps us mentally. It helps us process thoughts and memories. So when we're sleeping, we go through different stages of sleep. Um, one of the stages is called the REM stage. So REM just stands for rapid eye movement. And in the REM stage, um, our brain is actually very active. It's where we're doing most of our dreaming. And so in that stage, it's also helping us process our thoughts and memories from the day before. And just finally, sleep boosts our overall well-being. So, you know, when you wake up after a good night's sleep, you feel better, don't you? You feel ready for the day. Whereas, you know, waking up after a poor night's sleep, you're going to feel groggy, irritable, um, perhaps low in mood. And I'm sure that's something everybody can relate to. So lots of yeah. benefits. Yeah, it's, it's definitely what I can relate to today. So like you said, you know, I had that early night because my body and brain were so tired. But because it's been woken up, you know, really gruesomely early and, and didn't really get back to sleep and didn't get that quality in, you have just described how my brain is functioning or not uh, as we record this, Eleanor. You know, it, it's feeling groggy. Uh, if I'm trying to type something today, you know, it, it's not being spelled correctly or I'm not really coordinating myself properly. And you just think, goodness, that's just really one night's poor sleep how that has an immediate kind of impact us, on us and then you know the difficulties you know that we can have and and like you say um in terms of processing thoughts and memories there's often that suggestion you know if you're dealing with a problem why don't you sleep on it why don't you sleep on it think about it in the morning and, and you know see if a solution has appeared so it's really interesting tim is there anything that you'd like to sort of add to, to those things there um, for me, I think it's it's kind of being mindful of how long I can do a thing for. Like this week, I've been happy to stay up a little bit later um, just to do something I enjoy. And I haven't necessarily woken up feeling lower or, or ratty or more tired. And that's because I know that during the day, as long as I stick to my other, my other sleep hygiene things, I don't drink coffee after 12 o'clock um, and I try not to eat any later than sort of seven or eight. Um, but even if I do go to bed at two o'clock in the morning again, um, the the time I am asleep will be restful um, mm. and so I can probably mostly make it through to five o'clock today. Well let's let, say Tim and, and, and like you say it's like you know if you were doing this as a long-term thing you'd kind of perhaps look at it differently right. but but like you said you know you've, you've got your sleep hygiene and, and, and I know we'll go into a little bit more about that a little bit later on but yeah it, it's to me it's just really really interesting how much sleep can have an impact you know on you on your day and I'm kind of thinking out of the three of us today it's going to be Eleanor who's going to be feeling the best because she said she's had that peaceful sleep she's gone to you know gone to bed she's just woke up rested and uh yeah you and I are kind of like we'll probably touch base later on to see how we get sure. on but it's yeah it's like really interesting so what we did, we uh, asked the, the rest of the peer support workers within the team, actually, have they had any sleep challenges? Because, you know, from what we've already discussed, you know, sleep issues actually are really quite common. And yeah, we've got a variety of different things that uh, the guys kind of shared with us. So, Tim, would you mind kind of uh, letting us know what um, sleep challenges uh, the peer support workers have faced? For sure. And uh, this really speaks to how common these problems can be, I think, because mm. everything we're about to talk about is something I've experienced at some point or another. 
um, waking up too early, um, either waking up with anxiety or worrying, which can make it difficult to get back to sleep. I've totally been in that place where I've woken up and immediately a thought entered my brain that I've become fixated on um, and it just kind of circles around and I, I can't get back to sleep, which will incidentally feed into the next one, which is napping during the day because I haven't slept. I'm going to be exhausted, so I'm going to want to nap during the day. Um, and when I was unwell, this could vary from anywhere between an hour up to three or four hours, um, which is then going to feed into not being able to sleep that night. And um, one of the worries I used to have was that I'd worry that I wasn't going to be able to sleep, which would keep me up. And I think there's um, an odd kind of irony in that. And not being able to get off to sleep because of racing thoughts, um, not being able to switch off and relax and not being able to stay asleep. Um, again, it's something we've experienced before. And then night terrors and, and intense dreams. Um, again, this used to this used to make me anxious about going to sleep. Like, what's waiting for me um, in that in that world of sleep? And something I always used to think is I had to get eight, eight hours. Like, did I do I have to get eight hours? And what I've what I've discovered this week is that I, well, I already knew this, but six mm. six hours is something I can run on. Mm. And Eleanor, is it true that we need to get eight hours sleep, or is that a complete myth? So that, that's definitely a myth. Um, I mean, the average amount for an adult is between seven, seven to eight hours per night, but that's going to depend from person to person. You know, things like age and lifestyle all, all have an impact. Mm, yeah, and I think also, you know, if we have in our head, oh, I must get eight hours, I must get eight hours, and we wake up and we've had six, and we're like, oh, goodness me, I haven't had eight, what am I going to do? It's actually, I've learned to be more intuitive about my body and my brain and kind of thinking, you know, okay, um, like, you know, I've lost the ability to lie in, don't know where it's gone, it's disappeared, but, you know, it used to irritate me so much to be awake at six o'clock on a Saturday morning, so annoying, but I've kind of got to the point of, do you know what? My body and my brain are telling me, yeah, you've had enough sleep now, time time to be starting the day. And once I've let go of that, you know, that thought and feeling of, oh, I must have this, it's actually much nicer, not nicer, what's the word, much easier to deal with if I don't get hours in, you know, kind of, it's kind of different things. But yeah, Tim, lots of different things there. And, and the same as you, I've gone through all of these different things. I mean, one for me particularly is night terrors or very, very intense dreams where, you know, unfortunately sometimes I can wake up shouting and, you know, having, waking up, you know, have that feeling of what's going on. And then if I overthink the content of the dream, like you said, that then gives me worries and concerns about what's gonna, what's gonna hit me when I go to sleep. Do I want to go to sleep? And what I've had to do is just again have that acceptance of my brain does some interesting stuff when I'm asleep I don't need to read too much into it or anything into it I need to look after myself when I wake up in the middle of it so it might be some meditation it might be some deeper breathing um, you know just taking care of myself and it might be that my self-care needs to increase the day after so just, you know, doing things gently, not reading too much into it. But Eleanor, are these sort of common sleep challenges that you kind of hear in your work within the wellbeing service? Yeah, definitely. I do hear these types of sleep difficulties a lot from various people. So yeah, things like waking up too early and then feeling quite frustrated when you can't get back to sleep. And, you know, that's where perhaps tension and stress is going to build in your body and just make it even more difficult to get back to sleep. So it's a bit like a vicious cycle sometimes, isn't it? Yes, you know, definitely with me and the seagulls uh, in the early hours of this morning, because it's, you know, you're like, well, I'll try this, or I'll try that. And I thought, I'll get angry. And I thought, why am I getting angry? Because like you say, if I tense up, I won't be able to get back to sleep. I'll just be even more ratty than I, you know, I'm already feeling. And actually it was, you know, shut the windows, put some calming stuff on, and then was able to do it. But if I'd have stayed in the hole, oh, this is so annoying, I wouldn't 
got you know got back to sleep at all so you know it's really interesting how how common sleep challenges are and we also asked our peer support workers you know so you had these challenges you may still have them how did you overcome them what kind of things have helped you so tim do you mind kind of sharing with us you know what, what the guys have said about what's helped them for sure um so the first one that we've got was waking up worrying um and our peer support workers said that they listen to a mindfulness recording on the well-being website um and that helps them to focus on the present moment um and then they distract themselves by either watching tv or getting up and keeping busy mm. someone talked about daytime sleepiness um so they said that they do whatever needs sorting out in the house and then go back to bed um they set an alarm for half an hour um, before the children come home from school. A couple of the peer support workers talked about sleep hygiene. Um, they've got a um, bed, bedtime routine. Um, so they get things straight downstairs, um, have a hot bubbly bath, get into bed, make sure their phone's on silent, and then they read, and medita read or meditate. Um, and making sure the bedroom is dark enough says that it makes a difference. The other one on sleep hygiene, um, they, the RPA support worker said, was that turning off their phone at least two hours before bed, um, having a herbal tea or hot milk, um, having a hot bath with lavender oil, um, writing down their thoughts so they can empty their head, uh, reading for, before bed, and avoiding TV, which is scary or overstimulating. Um, and the final one we got was around night terrors and dreams. And what they said helps is to accept that that's what their brain does when it's stressed and have that self-care in terms of reducing stress as much as they can um, after having dreams or night terrors. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so, so, so kind of, you know, that, that's kind of my one there. And it's it's interesting, again, Tim, I'm looking at this and going, yeah, I've tried variations of all of these, you know, different things. I mean, particularly having a, a bedtime routine. So at the moment, I am going through a phase of needing to go, bed, go to bed really quite early, um, which has put my sleep routine out of sync. So, but normally it'd be like, you know, nine o'clock, okay, put my pajamas on, get myself ready for bed. So it means, you know, when you start to drop off on the sofa and you lay there and you're like, oh, I'm nodding, I'm nodding, I'm going. And then you drag yourself off up to bed. And I don't know about you guys, but I will then get to bed and then go, right, I'm really wide awake now. That was fun and helpful. And, you know, so what I've learned to do is get ready beforehand. So if I start dropping off on the sofa, I'm already ready for bed. I just need to get myself upstairs and then generally I do get into bed and then carry on that that sleep but yeah it's, it's looking at those kind of different things and you know having sort of routines finding out what works for us as well because you know um, a hot milk for me no that wouldn't work uh, a bath yeah that might so it's kind of yeah kind of working out what what to do and and Anna there you know in, in terms of what um, you know, you would say, say to people if they were having sleep challenges, you know, is there anything sort of else that you would be able to add in terms of what helps us to deal with this? Yeah, I mean, just to add on to your points about having a good bedtime routine, because I do think that's key to have a relaxing bedtime routine, but I also completely appreciate that can be really difficult to stick to at times. Um, you know, like you were saying, Rachel, something might crop up and then your routine goes out the window. But it's also important to be patient and persistent with these sleep tips because it can be very difficult to change old habits, can't it, and swap to new habits. So, yeah, the key is to really stick with these kind of sleep hygiene or sleep tips and just gradually build on them. Um, and sometimes you may not always be able to stick to them, but just, again, being kind to yourself and perhaps trying again the next evening is important. And I think what can be really difficult for me, and I don't know, Tim, if you're the same, is that when I've got that sleepy feeling, so I've got that sleepy feeling at like seven o'clock in the evening, and, you know, in my head I'm going, no, no, we, we need to stick to the routine, we need to go to, you know, get ready for bed at nine, and sort of head to bed sort of ten-ish, it's too early, it's too early, stay awake. And... I try, you know, I can try really, really hard with that, but the urge to sleep is just, I don't know, it's like primeval or something. It's just really, really strong. And, you know, the, the more I fight it, the sleepier I get. And in the end, it's like, oh, OK, 
I've tried really hard tonight, like you say, not beating yourself up, not having a go at yourself, just kind of using that self-care of, I've tried really, really hard, I've tried for as long as I can, but it's too much at the moment, so, you know, I need to take myself off to bed. I mean, Tim, you know, do, do you sort of have experiences that sort of link to that or, or not? Yeah, I think it's part of it for me is recognizing what doesn't work um, mm -hmm. as well as what does work. So I always think that I'll only ever change anything when the coping mechanism hurts more than the solution. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I used to do when I couldn't sleep was get up and have a coffee and a cigarette. And to, now I'm saying that to myself now, it, it's obvious that that's maybe not the ideal um, solution to, to poor sleep. But at the time, it's what helped um, in that moment. And recognizing that it wasn't conducive to a good night's sleep allowed me to slowly but surely make a change that I sort of leave my cigarettes in the car, way too lazy to walk outside and get them <laughs> at two in the morning. So that would, that would, yeah, that would help to make it more difficult to smoke. Um, and something I figured out <laughs> was that hot milk, vanilla and honey and cinnamon will make, will help me sleep better than a coffee, which is something I'll now reach for. Yeah, and but again, we, we have to learn this ourselves, don't we? I mean, yeah. Eleanor, w would you kind of say that reducing caffeine and sort of uh, cigarette intake in the later evening is, is something that you would often suggest to people, like sort of Tim said? Yeah, we do often encourage people to gradually reduce any stimulants. So, yeah, things like caffeine, nicotine, if you can gradually reduce and get used to that, um, it will really help your sleep. Yeah, and I think also, like you said, Tim, you kind of had to work that out for yourself. You know, it was like, oh, well, I'll, I'll do that. I know I want to do this. And actually, when we make those changes gradually for ourselves, we kind of then realise that's what we're, that's why we're doing it. This is why it helps. And it's interesting that, you know, Tim, you said about, uh, you know, in terms of sleep hygiene, avoiding television, which is sort of scary or overstimulating. Well, you know, when the um, previous sort of season of Line of Duty was on, it started at nine, it finished at 10. I'd sit there watching it through my fingers and then go, oh gosh, who is H? And, you know, then go to bed and wonder why I couldn't sleep. And so I had to work this out myself, despite knowing. Um, and then I was like, well, okay, don't go to bed at 10 because your brain is too wired. And, you know, I ended up going to bed at like two o'clock in the morning. And like Tim's already said, actually you know when you kind of do stuff like that it's interesting how it changes your sleep and you know previously i would have thought oh, two o'clock that's far too late went to bed at two head hit the pillow absolutely fast asleep woke up at six only had four hours but weren't they refreshing so you know like i say lots of different things that we can sort of tweak and try and i think tim there was a couple of other suggestions from our peer support workers yeah they talked about physical activity going for a long walk a run or a bike ride or getting fresh air during the day helps helps them sleep better at night um i can relate to that in a big way um even just fresh air to be honest working from home still at the moment that's kind of been our lives for the last year hasn't it mm -hmm. and yeah i know that it, it's something i learned over the last year that actually just stepping outside have bare feet on grass was relaxing um before bed and then the final one we had was um, around sleep environment. So a cold, dark room, having uh, linen and mattress and pillows and et cetera, sharing beds with people, so being mindful, is that is that the right thing for me right now? Yeah. Yeah, interesting things there. I mean, I know oh, I changed my pillows a couple of years ago when I realised actually how long I'd had my pillows for. And the change was immense, you know, and they, they weren't hugely expensive or anything like that. They were just not so old and lumpy. And, you know, the change to my sleep was, was really, really quite big. And Eleanor, in terms of sort of physical activity, is there anything that we shouldn't be doing before we go to sleep that, you know, might kind of, we might think it's helping that actually might interfere with our sleep sort of later? Yeah, I guess when we talk about exercise, we'd always encourage you to do it during the days rather than right before bed, because if you're doing it before bedtime, you're waking yourself up, you're waking your body up, um, which obviously isn't what you want right before bed. So perhaps some relaxing exercise like yoga or something might help before bed, but any kind of vigorous or intense exercise, try it and do it in the days as that's going to increase your need for sleep at night time. Mm. And Eleanor, in terms of people, 
people's sort of sleep environment, you know, um, like I said, changing my pillows made a big impact. Is that something that you hear from people that actually making those what seem like small tweaks to our environment can really help? Yeah, quite often it is those small tweaks or changes that do make the biggest difference. Um, I speak to a lot of people who have invested in perhaps a new pillow and it's and they've really noticed the benefits. Also, just thinking about sleep environment, it's worth thinking about the temperature of your bedroom. So quite often we do fall asleep easier in a cooler room because um, it allows our, bo- uh, sorry, our core body temperature to drop, which enables us to sleep. So it's worth thinking about those small changes to your environment. Mm. And I I know for me, you know, particularly in the summer, but I will sometimes sort of do it in colder times as well, having like that fresh air coming through. But also even in the winter, my, you know, my bedroom windows are open a little bit so I can have fresh air coming in during the day. And for me, that makes a real big difference if I'm going into a room with air in it as opposed to a stuffy bedroom and you know I'm not able to get to sleep in it so like you say it's it's the small little tweaks that we can make actually when we put them all together can have a massive impact on our sleep and you know I think I'm going to remember more of this when I'm trying to go to sleep tonight you know when I've got that urge to go to bed really early I'm going to try even harder not to and kind of you know try and use some of these different things to, to, to help me get a better night's sleep tonight than I did today. So thank you so much, Tim and Eleanor, for for joining me for today's podcast. It's been really, really interesting. So we've shared peer support worker lived experience examples of overcoming sleep challenges. If you're listening to this podcast today and would like to refer yourself to the Wellbeing Service, it's really simple. You can do so by visiting the Wellbeing website or you can do so by um, telephoning us. If you're listening today and you're currently having treatment within the Wellbeing Service and would like to have peer support, then please do speak to your therapist who can make the referral. So thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. And again, thank you so much, Tim and Eleanor, for joining me this afternoon. This afternoon, it's this morning. See, the sleep has affected my brain and I've totally lost uh, the idea of the time of day. It's it's just interesting how it affects me. Apologies. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for your time. And like I said, uh, next time uh, we our next podcast will be focusing on disability and mental health. So I'll say goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Please do subscribe. It's free and means the podcast will automatically download every fortnight. Do rate and review Mental Health and You and follow our social media accounts that are all in the show notes. And more than anything, look after yourself.